So, uh, good, good morning for everybody. We will begin the lecture. Unfortunately, the director is not here. I mean, the Nasri Vikas is not here, but anyway, it's time to start. Let me tell a few words about myself. I am a, a nuclear physicist. I worked on this field uh, over 30 years. And then now I will talk about measurements of nuclear data for prompt gamma activation analysis. What does it mean? Uh, it means that uh, uh, to be able to analyze uh, uh, different kind of samples in terms of elemental composition, we need to have some kind of comparison to either to similar sample or some database. And uh, this approach, what I'm, I will talk today, is uh, using the, a database, and I will uh, present you that how it was built up. But before we begin all of this, uh, let me have uh, some introduction about nuclear analytical methods. The main purpose of all kind of uh, analytical methods is to measure elemental or isotopic compositions or uh, some other fields uh, people want to measure chemical composition of uh, some unknown samples. The nuclear analytical methods are analytical methods uh, which are using uh, poorly nuclear uh, technology. And what you can see here is a list of uh, existing analytical methods. One of the um, most earliest one of it is the instrument cell neutron activation analysis. Then there is a, a version of that which is uses uh, radio chem chemical separation uh, at the same time neutron activation analysis. This is called uh, uh, RNAA. Then uh, uh, today's talk will be about uh, the so-called prompt gamma neutron activation analysis. Many times we drop a neutron, but it could be proton, for example. So some people like to make difference between the two uh, things. So most of the time I will talk about uh, PGAA instead of PGNAA. Then uh, uh, there is the so-called atomic mass spectrometry, which is one of the most uh, sensitive method between all of them, which what sensitivity means. Sensitivity means that uh, one method is very sensitive it can, if it can observe very little amount of the element or isotope which we are interested in. Then uh, there are some other uh, methods which is based on, on accelerator-induced uh, uh, spectrometry. Uh, one of it is the so-called uh, proton-induced uh, X-ray emission. In this case, the samples are irradiated with protons, which induce X-ray uh, emission of the, the atoms within the uh, sample, and uh, we analyze the X-rays. Then uh, uh, there is another version, which is called uh, uh, PIGE. -E, uh, uh, P -P -E. This is the proton-induced gamma ray emission. And this method is able to get information more depth from the sample because the gamma rays are more, more uh, uh, penet uh, penetration power through the material than the X-rays. Then uh, uh, one can use instead of proton uh, alpha particle, then it is uh, uh, called alpha-induced gamma ray uh, spectrometry. And there is also another uh, method which is uh, not so sensitive. This is the instrumental photon activation analysis. And there is some reference uh, at the end. You can look up if you wish. <coughs> now, what are the advantages of uh, these uh, nuclear analytical methods? It's summarized in this table. Uh, the non-destructive feature is a very important thing. If somebody do not want to solve the sample or do not want to take uh, any part of it, then uh, uh, it, this method uh, must be applied. And uh, uh, there is a list of so the PGA, the PIGI, PIGI, and uh, uh, the IPAA is such a method. 
you don't need to prepare the sample, you simply put into, into an excitation beam, then uh, you can get the analytical signal out of the, uh, the sample. The analytical signal is, of course, uh, produ uh, induced by the incoming particle, and uh, it can uh, involve uh, either the, the nuclei interaction or the atomic interaction or both. Uh, there are some very sensitive methods. This one of the, uh, these are the, the neutron activation analysis, the radiochemical nu neutron activation analysis, and the atomic mass spectrometry. For bulk analysis, uh, the best method of bulk means that if we want to penetrate deep in the sample, then uh, we need to use the features of uh, neutrons instead of uh, inducing reactions with the charged particle. The charged particle range in material is usually a few micrometer, or the X-ray has a similar a feature so we can only study the surface of the sample. But these methods are able to study the internal region of uh, bigger samples on the order of centimeter. So uh, there are two of these. This is the prompt gamma activation analysis and the, the photon in induced activation analysis. There are also disadvantages of these methods. Of course, there are many other methods. For example, the, most of you probably heard about the uh, ICPMS, which is uh, able to analyze uh, very small quantities, but uh, this is a very painful process to solve uh, the samples uh, many times, especially, for example, geological samples can be solved very difficult without uh, having any residue of the material unsolved. So if you want to make it right, then uh, then you need to make sure that you digest all of the sample, then you can make uh, some experiments with ICPMS. Then there is uh, many versions of uh, the ion-coupled ion, uh, plasma spectrometry that is, uh, stands for ICP. There is the optical emission spectroscopy, and there are many other versions. There are, uh, uh, this, the nuclear methods are usually slower than uh, some atomic methods. The atomic methods, uh, which uh, uses only the, the electronic feature of the material, is, it is uh, the X-ray resonance fluorescence, or uh, the infrared Fourier transform spectroscopy, or uh, uh, X-ray induced electron spectroscopy. These are uh, already uh, able to distinguish between the chemical uh, composition of the material, chemical surrounding of the material. Now, we switch uh, to the PGA method, that uh, what are the basic features of, of the method. You can uh, summarize on this picture. This is the principle of the, the new, uh, uh, prompt gamma um, neutron activation analysis. So that once uh, we have a neutron beam, then uh, we can put some target into the beam. Then the, the uh, target uh, uh, nuclei can be uh, capture a neutron and uh, get into a highly excited states. The excitation energy in this case is in between uh, uh, seven to uh, six to eight MeV. Then this highly excited nucleus. Uh, always emits gamma rays, or 99% uh, of the cases emits uh, directly gamma rays at uh, this uh, very high, from, uh, to the excite from this very highly excited state. And uh, uh, via uh, cascade of gamma transitions, which is depicted here in this uh, simplified level scheme, so a cascade would be if this is the the capture state, then uh, you have a cascade of two is drawn. In this case, uh, this is uh, going to be a, a direct transition to the ground state of the nucleus, which is called primary transition. So all of the transitions are coming from the capture state is called primary transitions. All the others are called secondary transitions. Once uh, the, this uh, highly excited state is uh, is de-excited to the ground state, then there are two possibilities. 
one possibility is that the ground state is stable, then we don't get any more information from the reaction. However, if the, the ground state is not stable, then we can, uh, it can be followed, for example, by uh, beta decay. Then we get uh, more information from the beta uh, decay. And in fact, this part of the, the analytical signal is called the prompt gamma analytical sig signal. And this one is delayed, and it is used in the neutron activation analysis. Delayed means that it can uh, uh, come uh, within a second uh, or to several days or even years. <coughs> so in, uh, from this point of view, the neutron activation analysis is uh, usually a very long process. Once you excite uh, uh, atomic nuclei of the sample in the reactor, then you have to wait uh, for a long time to get all of the analytical information from the sample and measure it time to time uh, to, to be able re to resolve the long-lived uh, components of the, of the analytical signal. Okay, then uh, the, uh, how is it sensitive for the, the uh, elemental or isotopic composition uh, to the sample? The, the gamma rays, which are emitted from uh, the various nuclei in the sample, has gamma ray energy. So we take a spectrum of it. Then uh, it shows up in the spectrum as some peaks. Then the energy of the gamma ray is sensitive uh, to the, uh, is characteristic to the uh, element or isotope inside the sample, while the intensity of the gamma rays uh, is uh, proportional to the mass of the the nuclei in the sample. There, uh, the, one of the uh, most important governing things which uh, 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 influences the, the prompt gamma activation analysis is the cross-section of the materials. You have already seen yesterday uh, some presentation from Exford. This is a, a very simple uh, uh, cross-section uh, uh, curve uh, uh, against the incident neutron energy down here. And uh, this one was uh, collected uh, uh, for uh, uh, 59 uh, cobalt uh, neutron radioactive capture. By the way, the, this process is also called radioactive, radiative capture. And uh, uh, the signal which is coming out is, is radiation of photons. So as you can see here, uh, the, the, this, this part of the, the cross-section as a function of energy is uh, fairly smooth, uh, can be approximated very well with a line. And uh, this part uh, in most of the nuclei follows the 1 over V rule. So the cross-section is decreasing as a function of the incident uh, velocity of neutrons. So larger the the velocity, the, the lower the cross-section. So very low energy, high cross-section. Larger energy is, is lower cross-section. In fact, this part is always going through all of the, the spectra. At some places, then the resonances appears. But you also heard the R matrix treatment of these resonances. And uh, the way you describe the resonances is based on, uh, on uh, the wigner braid uh, theory, which, which actually uh, states that all, all, all of the resonances has a, uh, a, a very distinct shape and similar shape for all of them. The only difference is the height and the width of the peaks. Now, what are the other uh, constituents of the uh, prompt gamma activation analysis? We need neutron sources. There are many different kinds of neutron sources. The, the, the simplest, cheapest uh, way to uh, create neutrons uh, is via uh, radioactive sources, which, uh, in which, uh, for example, the plutonium-barium source or 
Ameri Cimberilim sauce or Californium 252. Uh, these are different uh, from the point of view of uh, neutron creation. The, the plutonium barium source is consisting of uh, uh, plutonium, which is an alpha decaying nucleus, and beryllium, which is able to produce neutrons via the alpha N uh, process. And they are usually mixed in powder form and put into a, a small a capsule, which is uh, then placed into the source. The californium is different. The californium is able to uh, fission without any uh, outer uh, excitation. So this, uh, uh, this is called uh, spontaneously fissioning nucleus. This produces also neutrons via uh, fission. Then uh, the other possibility to produce neutrons are the various uh, 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 charged particle reactions. So most famous, uh, two most famous are written here. The DD helium-3 neutron production is, uh, is uh, uh, useful in the MeV range, while the DT alpha N reaction uh, uh, is uh, giving an energy about 14 MeV. <coughs> then instead of uh, having these uh, uh, simple reactions, one can use more complicated reactions uh, uh, using uh, accelerated particles, induced uh, spallation. This, uh, in this process, one can use, for example, high-energy protons, which then hits uh, uh, heavy targets with a lot of neutrons. People like to put targets uh, with excess of neutrons, and also very dense. And, uh, targets which can stand uh, uh, high temperature, because usually to produce a large amount of neutrons, you need a lot of energy. The energy can be go up uh, to a megawatt on these uh, targets, and in fact, in the newest facility, which is just under construction, the European uh, spallation source, is uh, designed uh, to have five uh, megawatt on the target which is already very substantial, and the uh, cooling must be made for, the, for this kind of targets. Um, as we learned also yesterday, that uh, each of these uh, protons can produce on the order of 25, 30 neutrons in these heavy targets. For example, uh, tungsten or tantalum or some other uh, targets can be liquid, like mercury or a liquid uh, lead target. Then also has uh, some other reactions, which is the photo-induced fission. And a very good example uh, is the, the gale, a linear accelerator with this process. So once an uh, 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 electron beam hits the uranium target, then it makes a, a Bremsstrahlung in the uranium, then the Bremsstrahlung uh, uh, produces uh, gamma rays, and it produces a fission of the uranium target. Then from fission, we obtain the, the neutrons. Uh, this uh, facility, these facilities uh, can be used in pulsed mode, and uh, 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 so we can perform uh, time-of-flight experiments uh, just uh, similar to one we already heard uh, uh, at, at, in the case of CERN. The Alternative uh, to this uh, creation is the, the regular uh, thermal research reactors. There are many research reactors. We also learned in this school uh, there are about 200 to 300 reactors, many of them uh, uh, producing uh, radio nuclei for medicine, and uh, uh, very few of them are really doing experimental work around the, the reactors. In these reactors, the source of the, the neutrons is the fission of the uh, uranium-235, usually, which is uh, uh, put in the reactor core. And these uh, reactors are called research reactors. Uh, what are the possible geometries uh, uh, to do such an analysis? So if you want to excite uh, 
some sample and uh, uh, we ask what, uh, what does it contain. Then there are two possibilities. Uh, I, I, uh, it can be uh, understood as a, uh, a proton uh, spallation source or a reactor <laughs> internal part. So once we put a sample close to the, for example, reactor core, then we can uh, make activation of the sample. Then if we have a corresponding tube, which let the gamma rays come out from the sample, then we can measure it at the end of the tube. The problem with this geometry is that uh, there are many other gamma rays which is created in, in the uh, environment around the sample, which is very difficult to distinguish from the, from the sample we actually put into the, uh, into the activation place. And another alternative is that we try to lead the neutrons out from the uh, close uh, from the reactor core, and then uh, this is also a tube, and it can be now a very specialized tube. Then uh, later I will talk about that. Then we can put the tar target uh, to the end of this tube. Then the neutrons are hitting the target, producing gamma rays. Then we can detect it uh, with uh, some detector. This geometry is called external geometry, while the other one is the internal target geometry. There are examples for that uh, in life. Uh, the, one of the most famous internal target geometry reactor uh, was uh, constructed in Oak Ridge. And in fact, uh, it was uh, designed such a way that uh, it uh, had minimized the amount of gamma rays coming from the structural materials of the reactor. So the samples uh, produced uh, um, excess uh, gamma rays uh, compared to the, uh, the background gamma rays, which is coming from the structural material of the reactor. And uh, some, uh, then uh, uh, people could do uh, rather good experiments uh, in the, at, at this place. The, of course, the advantage is that the, the flux, neutron flux, is very large, but then uh, the gamma rays which are coming out follow the, uh, basically the one over R square rule, so then it will be, uh, at the end of the channel, it will be attenuated. In the other geometry, in the, the external geometry, the neutrons of, are following the R square rule, but they, we can go close uh, to the target, so the gamma rays basically uh, can be, uh, all of them captured with a suitable detector system. So this is the, this is what people are using the most, and the most advanced <coughs> guides which uh, let the neutrons out from the reactors are the so-called cold neutron guides. The advantage of this system is once we cool down the neutrons, then the neutrons can be guided by some so-called mirror guides with very uh, small losses. And uh, if we curve the mirror guide from the straight line of the, uh, the tube which uh, lets the neutrons out from the reactor, then we are able to uh, get out from the way of the direct beam coming out from the reactor and make a very nice environment, a very low background environment at the experimental stations. The other important factor is, of course, the, the detectors. Uh, we want to op observe the gamma rays uh, coming out from the sample, and we need to have uh, good de detectors for that. In the past, before the, the uh, germanium or the uh, diode kind of uh, detectors, uh, uh, people use the, the uh, sodium iodine reactor, uh, sodium iodine uh, detector. However, the resolution was not so great. It has a, a rather good efficiency, and uh, everything now is compared to the sodium detectors. If we are talking about a 20% uh, high purity germanium detectors, then it is in a fixed geometry. Uh, it, uh, the, 
the signal is 20% uh, of a sodium uh, crystal efficiency. So then uh, once you get 100 count in a peak from sodium crystal, then uh, uh, with a 20% uh, germanium, it means that you get only 20. So this is a relative number. Then uh, there were some more works uh, to enhance uh, the, uh, the resolution of the scintillator uh, crystals. And uh, now the, the most advanced crystals are, are the lanthanum hal halide crystals. And uh, you can see two versions of it, uh, chloride and bromide, lanthanum chloride and bromide crystal. Uh, both of them has uh, a rather good resolution. 2%, uh, so what does it mean? At what 1 MeV, the resolution of this detector is uh, 20 keV. Uh, if the uh, resolution follows the square root of the energy for these reactors, and the efficiency is uh, higher than uh, uh, in the case of the sodium iodine. Uh, do you, anybody knows why it is higher? What do you think? You can see the composition here. Why this one has higher efficiency? Hmm? Not only the density, but the charge. Photo, photo uh, absorption of the peaks, which, uh, which is the most important process. Uh, in, a, in a gamma ray observation in the detector is going all, uh, with a high power of uh, the charge. The highest the charge number of the uh, constituent in the reactor, uh, the higher the efficiency. And the lanthanum has higher Z than, than iodine in the sodium detector. So then it is able to, to produce more efficiently a gamma rays. Now the, 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 we arrive to the, the modern uh, high resolution react, uh, uh, detectors, which is called the high purity germanium detector. In the past, it was uh, activated with lithium, so they, they were called the jelly, germanium lithium uh, detector. The, both of them has a, a very good resolution. It's on the order of 0.1%. It means for one MeV that you, you have one key EV also resolution. Then uh, due to the, again, to the charge of germanium is, is lower than uh, iodine in the sodium iodine detector, the efficiency is lower. But the resolution is much higher. Then uh, there are so-called uh, composite detectors. So the simplest one has only one crystal of it, and the composite detectors has many crystals. The advantage of the comp composite crystals is that once uh, one of the crystals is hit by a gamma ray, then uh, 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 can go through two processes, basically, or three. But the most important is the Compton, uh, Compton scattering. The other important is the the uh, uh, photo absorption, uh, but uh, most of the time, or 50% uh, of the cases, it will be co Compton scattered and arrives uh, somewhere in the neighborhood. But if you put uh, detectors there, then you can catch them. So the composite detector is able to uh, produce uh, a photo, uh, full energy peak, so to say, even when uh, the uh, two crystals or three crystals are uh, producing uh, the signal. Then the, this, is, uh, this uh, uh, organization, geometry of crystals, is called clover, because it looks like a clover of uh, the flower uh, leaf. And there is another one, uh, which is uh, called uh, Eurocluster, and this is uh, uh, constructed from uh, seven crystals. Uh, one in the middle and, uh, and six around it. And this is called to be a, a, a composite detector. Uh, a simple, uh, then, uh, then uh, since uh, uh, we cannot use infinitely large uh, uh, detectors, then the gamma rays uh, in a uh, uh, substantial amount of the time, uh, Compton scatters out from this 
crystal and uh, we do not observe a full energy peak. The full energy peak uh, is only characteristic to the, to the uh, elements or uh, isotope which produced and not the Compton scatter peak. So uh, in order to be able to reduce uh, such a signal to, uh, in the measurement, then uh, we usually use so-called BGO uh, guard detector. The BGO guard detector has a hole in it, and it has a, a, a tapered shape, like a, a cylinder, but tapered. Then uh, one can put the, the germanium detector inside this crystal, then make a composite detector. The composite detector in this case can be used to suppress the Compton uh, uh, signals uh, produced uh, in the germanium detector. So if we use it in anti-coincidence mode, we can decrease the Compton events uh, which would appear in the germanium detector spectrum. <coughs> and not only that, it can also guard the detector from the uh, ambient background, which is coming from the outside the detector system. So outside the radiation can come from this direction, not from the axial uh, direction of the detector. In fact, this is a lead shielding around the uh, uh, guard detector. And uh, when you put the germanium detector inside the guard detector, then, then you can use it as a composite detector. And uh, lead shielding is still needed because uh, nobody wants to irradiate directly uh, the guard detector. Uh, the guard detector has much higher efficiency than the, uh, the uh, internal detector, so that is better to avoid. Otherwise, we will see most of the time the guide detector signals. So then uh, uh, you need uh, uh, such a uh, com uh, shielding. This, in this case, this is a 10 centimeter thick LED shielding. The detector inside is uh, weighting on the order of 30, 40 kilos, made of uh, bismuth germinate. Uh, the bismuth has very high Z, so it has a very high uh, photo peak efficiency. And so it can make up a nice system. Let's see that how it works. So once uh, we have a gamma ray hitting, uh, I repeat it. One, once it, we have a gamma ray hits uh, the germanium detector, then uh, you see it in uh, two projections. Then uh, it, it showed a, a photo absorption, so it was fully absorbed. But we have possibility to Compton scatter out, then I repeat that one. So then it goes, then it goes uh, to one of the segments of the guard detector. Then uh, you, you can use the signal to to stop the acquisition. So then you get rid of the Compton even from the detector, and this is the effect. What you can see, this is a, was a a prompt gamma ray spectrum on, on a PVC sample, which contains chlorine. And as you can see, this is the so-called normal mode when we don't use the Compton suppression. The detector is sitting in nice uh, shielding, but uh, we do not switch on the, the Compton suppression, then you, you have uh, this spectrum. This, uh, then uh, when you switch on the Compton suppression of the system, then it reduces the background. Are the, peaks, like, the, the peaks are completely normalized. So that, that was one of the points that we matched up the, the area, in fact, not, not, not the height, but the area of the signals. So then at higher energy, uh, you can read here that you can uh, uh, have on the order of uh, 20 suppression in the, the Compton background at lower energy. This is a little bit less on the order of five. But this reduces substantially the, the background uh, below the peaks, which uh, uh, gives us a possibility uh, to be more sensitive uh, for the same amount of photo peaks. 
Now, how does it go in life? So you need a source. Uh, uh, here you can see the Budapest Research Reactor. Then uh, once uh, it produces the neutrons, uh, which uh, in this case uh, the neutrons are guided out here, then uh, you can see here some neutron guides, how it looks in the real life. So these are, uh, you can uh, think of like a mirror, but the, the, we are not using the mirror uh, from the, the glass side, but from the back. So the, whatever is in the back of the mirror, we use that to reflect neutrons. So once uh, the, you also learn from the scattering lengths. So the nickel is one of the uh, uh, nucleus, which has a, a very large uh, elastic scattering lengths. Then we cover uh, this uh, uh, glass mirror with nickel layer. Then the nickel serves as a, a reflection material for the neutrons. It is able to produce a total reflection on the surface, and uh, usually the, the, the incident angle uh, must be below uh, one uh, degree, so very low. We are talking about very low uh, angle. Then it can, uh, the neutron can totally uh, reflect back from the surface without any loss. So then uh, uh, this way, this, uh, uh, if you make a, a long guide of it with a, a mirror surrounded hole, then the neutrons will be bouncing over the, the guide and arrive to the experimental uh, station. Uh, these uh, guides, what you can see here, has a, 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 a 10 centimeter high and two and a half centimeter width. Uh, uh, cross section, so that that's uh, uh, the 25 uh, centimeters square uh, is available for the neutrons uh, uh, to be guided. Now, the, uh, uh, then once, uh, then uh, uh, then you have to also cover it uh, with biological shielding. It is not shown here because it was just at the production stage. Then. Uh, uh, the, uh, the neutrons arriving uh, to an experimental station, you can see here that the detector, which was shown before, uh, the neutrons are coming from this hole. The guide ends uh, about a meter uh, from this wall. And then we have only a fly tube. So the fly tube is used for, for uh, being able to make a vacuum in the system, and of course the the guide system is all, all also under vacuum. So the neutrons are flying in vacuum and do not interact with the ambient air. Uh, here you can also produce va vacuum in this system. Then there, then, then there is a target chamber and there is the detector. Then the detector is observing the, the radiation from the excited nucleus and goes into some nuclear electronics then uh, uh, a multi-channel analyzer can be used to collect the gamma spectrum. Then uh, once you collected your gamma spectrum, then you have to analyze it. This shows this step. Then uh, we will uh, have a practice on that one. And then you can uh, produce a, a table using the library uh, of the composition of the, the material you measured. And if you have many of these compositions, then people like to use uh, statistical methods to make groups between uh, uh, the samples. Not, not always uh, one need to do that, but in case of uh, uh, geology, this is a uh, practice that you measure uh, hundreds of samples then make uh, groups, or archaeology is uh, typical examples. Uh, this table summarizes the main feature of the neutron activation analysis. So this is, uh, as we learned, uh, nuclear analytical method, the energy is, is uh, corresponds to the element or isotope. We always op observe isotopes, but I'm talking about element, and uh, you will learn how you can make it from isotopes to elements. Uh, because uh, chemists are usually interested in that one and not in the isotope. 
uh, then uh, the intensity is proportional to the quantity of the, the element in, in the sample. And uh, as I told you, this is non-destructive, so then uh, we, we can take uh, whatever sample, we can take the stick and put it into the neutron beam and uh, analyze it. That, uh, what, uh, what is this made of? The, and it is also a multi-analysis technique, so it is able to produce uh, signals from all of the elements, which is the, in, the, the, in the sample. Of course, it has different uh, sensitivity. Or, uh, this is one of the methods which is able to, uh, to observe, for example, hydrogen in, in, in uh, samples, which is very important in many applications. So we uh, try to use it, and uh, it is uh, also uh, valid for boron, which has a high cross-section. We can uh, measure boron very well in a prompt gamma activation analysis. And in fact, we can measure all the other light elements like oxygen, carbon, which is important for biological samples. Uh, later, I will uh, uh, talk about that, uh, what is the disadvantage with these light elements. The, uh, so in practice, we do, do not need any uh, preparation of the sample, which is a big advantage. So we can use the sample as it is. Then uh, uh, the method gives, uh, because the neutrons can penetrate deep in the material and the gamma, high energy gamma rays can out, come out from uh, deep from the material, it produces a, a so-called average composition of the irradiated volume. Then uh, the method is exact for homogeneous thin samples. Uh, that is always the case in uh, all of the analytical uh, methods. Um, it produces negligible uh, activation of the sample. Uh, most of the case, uh, the samples uh, can be taken away uh, just after the irradiation. In some cases, we have to wait a few days uh, to decay out the fast components. The long components uh, will not be excited uh, too much uh, because of the the saturation for those is, takes uh, much longer time. The flux is not sufficient to saturate them fast. And uh, in fact, you activated them, but you get uh, very slowly back the radiation. So it is usually below uh, all of the uh, clearance levels. If we have long lived nuclei activated in the sample, if we have a medium that can be shaky, like uh, silver is one of the bad examples, we cannot irradiate them very long in uh, uh, activation analysis because then it becomes uh, uh, just the right combination. So it, uh, the lifetime and the activation we can make on this target is, is usually brings uh, the sample above the clearance level in a, in a few hours. Okay, then uh, it provides a fast and instant result. Which, what does it mean? So as, as long as we switch on the acquisition and the beam on the sample, then in a few minutes we already see peaks. So we can uh, in a few minutes tell uh, a rough composition of the sample. This is uh, usually rather rare uh, without any uh, sample preparation. We do not need uh, so-called external standards. We do not need to measure a similar sample uh, before or after the sample we are measuring. We can uh, produce composition, uh, so uh, uh, a way which is called internal standardization. So relative to each other, or even uh, in some cases, absolute values can be given. Uh, Good for major components, oops, major components of the sample, and uh, some minor uh, or trace components can be also measured. These are the most important are, are the hydrogen, as I mentioned, the boron, and some of the uh, rarest nuclei can be measure, measured, which has very high cross section on a trace level. Uh, as you all know, the, the cross-section from nuclei or element to element is uh, varying in a very large scale. It is not similar to the, to the, uh, the other uh, competing method 
which is the X-ray excitation, the X-ray fluorescence, where the, the sensitivity is increasing with the charge. So the higher the charge, the larger the sensitivity for the element. In this case, this is very random. So some elements have very high cross-section, some in the neighbor uh, has very low cross-section. But if from this point of view, the two methods are uh, uh, complementary to each other. Uh, how can we use uh, the signal to determine the mass of the sample is sum summarized here. This is very simple. So we measure, we measure the peak area. Actually, we measure hundreds of them. So we can select the big, biggest one, or we can select uh, many of them, then use in this formula. Then the, the peak area is proportional to the mass of the irradiated uh, area in the sample and the uh, so-called sensitivity and, of course, the time. And, in fact, the, uh, the, the, the precision of the mass, if you, if you reorganize this uh, simple equation, the precision of the mass can be increased with the measurement time. Uh, in fact, uh, to infinitely, but uh, of course, then uh, we do not have usually that much of time. Now, what is the sensitivity? You can uh, see here. So the the peak area is depends on the the cross section of the element or nucleus which is irradiated, the so-called uh, gamma ray production uh, probability in uh, one neutron capture. That's what this measures. And of course, the mass of the certain element in the sample, uh, which uh, which is uh, uh, actually it is it is outside by it, but this this one uh, uh, is uh, uh, put into the sensitivity, and then uh, the flux. So the higher the flux, the better uh, the better uh, better at the sensitivity the efficiency of the detector. So then uh, from this point of view that uh, uh, yesterday we, you discussed that uh, for high resolution it is better to have only one detector. This is uh, sometimes good, but it's, we would like to have more because then we can increase, the, of course, the efficiency, but uh, it depends on, also on the budget of the... And uh, at this, if you use, uh, instead of one detector, you use uh, 20 detectors, then you need to analyze 20 spectra. So this is uh, uh, much more laborious. So people are not tending to use many detectors for this kind of analysis. And uh, there are some uh, uh, problems also, which is summarized in F. This is the... This is a factor which uh, takes into the account the absorption of the neutrons within the target. So the, as the neutrons are passing uh, through the target, then uh, the intensity is uh, continuously changing, decreasing. And also the gamma rays uh, can be absorbed by the sample. The higher energy is uh, in a less uh, uh, significantly than the lower energy. Lower energy can be ve very much uh, absorbed in a centimeter size sample. So then it's better not to use them. <coughs> okay, so then uh, uh, how then uh, one proceeds? So once we have uh, uh, the peak areas analyzed in the spectrum, then we can feed it into some program. We, I will demonstrate that tomorrow, uh, how to do that, but this summarizes how the program works. So there is an input module which uh, inputs uh, basically the list of uh, the energies and the uh, areas of the peaks which are found in the, in the sample. Then it compares to a library uh, which has uh, uh, and uh, other uh, parameters uh, used in the comparison. So then uh, there is a so-called 25-line uh, library, so it uh, lists uh, only uh, up to the uh, 25 uh, most intense gamma rays, uh, which uh, uh, gives you uh, already 1,800 1, uh, data. Uh, then there is a 1% library, which is used uh, to calculate the interferences between uh, gamma rays. 
<coughs> then we also need uh, some other inputs from outside, like molecular ways, oxidation number, self-absorption, uh, to be able to correct uh, for, for these effects. And then uh, uh, we need to subtract the, back the background. It is done uh, uh, with the, the equivalent mass, uh, uh, how should I, concept. So we, we try to determine the equivalent mass, uh, which we need to put into the sample position to get the same amount of what we collect from the background, which is not from the sample position. It can be there because then, uh, as you see, that uh, the station is made up uh, from uh, material. So then uh, there is an aluminum tube, which is a fly tube. So then we ought to see some aluminum in the spectrum. <coughs> Due to the fly tube or the lead shielding contains lead, so lead will be there. If we do not apply uh, vacuum, then uh, the air will be seen in the spectrum. So nitrogen is seen, oxygen is seen. Hydrogen is seen because that can also be in vapor in the spectrum. So many, many things that you have to correct uh, for the background. Then we need a, a efficiency for the system, which is regularly taken. Once we change something on the detector system, then we measure the efficiency. So we already have uh, <coughs> hundreds of experiments on efficiency, and they it shows to be very stable for a, a stable geometry. But anyway, we have a, a so-called date range. We use an efficiency for a quarter and a year. Then uh, the program automatically selects uh, the, the, the efficiency which corresponds to the acquisition time of the spectrum. Then uh, there are other parameters which is needed, beam temperature, flux, the density of the sample, etc., thickness, which uh, has to be entered. Then there is a data evaluation module, which then uh, grinds all of this input and makes uh, uh, calculates uh, the output. Then uh, there's an output module, which formats it in a readable uh, format, and it lets you change. So then uh, tomorrow, we will, uh, in the afternoon, we will see how you can change uh, uh, the, the program does something, but if, if you are not satisfied with it, then you can change it. And it does it uh, uh, online. So then uh, with a, a few uh, a click or a type, you can change the, the input, basically, which uh, uh, is used uh, to calculate the output. And uh, then uh, in this case, then, uh, uh, a trained person is needed uh, with a lot of experience uh, to be able to judge the quality of the result. Nobody tells you that what it should be. OK, so this is done in an iterative way. Uh, once you are satisfied with the, this uh, iterative uh, adjustment of the, the result, then you arrive to the final result. All of this is written in this reference. This is uh, how an output uh, looks like from the, from the uh, uh, program. You can see here a, a so-called bioash. So this is a, as one of those green, uh, we were asked to measure the bioash composition, one of those green uh, 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 electric power companies which burn uh, biomaterial, basically wood. <laughs> Unfortunately, most of the biomaterial is coming from wood. Then uh, they were interested in to find out the, whether they can use uh, the ash uh, as a, a fertilizer of, uh, of, uh, on, on field, so in the agriculture. So the, one of the major points was to measure the toxic component of the ash, and this is a uh, the table we obtained for one of the sample. Uh, the sample size uh, was on the order of a gram. And you can see here many things that we acquired that for 40 seconds. Uh, here is the neutron flux, one and a half times to the times eight. 
so-called thermal equivalent flux, uh, temperature of the beam, then the background was used, and then, then uh, you, you can list the elements you see in the sample. Then uh, this is the so-called measured mass, then you can subtract the background from the uh, measured mass, then you get uh, the net mass, then uh, finally you can express that in various different ways. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, the atomic composition in percentage and the uh, and, uh, uh, PPM part uh, from Leon. Uh, then uh, you can have elemental to elemental composition, uh, total element, F1 element to total element composition, then uh, one element to oxide form of the element, and also oxide to oxide. This always gives different numbers, but you don't need to calculate them from, it's not that difficult to calculate, of course, but it, it does, the program does it for us. Then whatever uh, is required in the, uh, what, what uh, people want to know, that uh, nuclear physicists like the atomic composition, the chemists uh, or geologists like the oxide to oxide composition, the chemist likes the element to element composition, so then uh, we can give all of them. Uh, a little bit more about the, the uh, neutron source, uh, so then uh, this is also the place where, where I am from. So the, uh, I'm from Hungary, Budapest, and uh, there is a research center which is uh, run by the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Uh, situated in the hills, uh, this is here, and this is an aerial, aerial view of the research center. Uh, in Hungarian, we abbreviate it as KFKI. This is, uh, used to be the center for physics in Hungary, and now it is, uh, um, uh, it, uh, it is not called anymore center of physics, but this is uh, nevertheless uh, still a campus uh, where uh, research is going on. Right now, there are two big uh, centers. Uh, one of it is the, the Energy Research Center, where I am from, and the other one is the so-called Wigner uh, Physics Center, uh, which is uh, another uh, center in the campus. Anyway, the, the Energy Research Center runs uh, the Budapest Research Reactor, and uh, some history of the reactor uh, can be seen here. So it started up in 59 uh, uh, with 2 megawatt power, then it was upgraded to 5 megawatt in 67. Then there was a major reconstruction in this period uh, after uh, uh, basically uh, 30 years of operation. And then uh, uh, there were also an upgrade of the uh, possible power, and in 2000 we installed the, the so-called cold source, then uh, in uh, 2012 uh, we shifted to the 20% enriched uh, uranium fuel from uh, originally 36% enriched we used. Then uh, we also have a so-called Budapest Neutron Center, uh, which uh, uh, en enables uh, uh, the uh, researchers around the, in the campus, uh, the utilization of the reactor, so this uh, coordinates the work between the, the Energy uh, Research Center and the Wigner Research Center uh, to use uh, the research reactor. Uh, the PGA facility was uh, uh, commissioned in 1995, then we upgraded uh, it uh, into two experimental stations in 2001. Then we did um, detector upgrades, cabin upgrade, and then the, we also have now uh, uh, radiograph system, neutral radiograph system built in uh, to this station. This is how the reactor uh, surrounding look like. The reactor building is here. Then uh, offices are in the front, and then we have a so-called neutron guide hall. So the cold neutrons are coming in, into this hall, and uh, there are uh, experimental stations uh, around the cold neutron source. 
in, in this hall. And there are also uh, experimental stations uh, uh, next to the reactor. And this is situated in that building. Here you can see the main features of the reactor. I don't go over it. Uh, the most important thing to know that it has uh, 10 radio, uh, 10 channels uh, in about one meter high, from uh, which leads out the neutrons uh, for experimental purposes from the reactor. Uh, eight of them are radial, and two of them are tangential, so-called tangential, so this one and that one. And one of the tangential, which is called the tenth channel, has this cold source. The cold source is uh, very, cold, very close to the reactor core, and it is uh, about a half a liter uh, liquid hydrogen, which uh, helps to cool down the neutrons. Uh, uh, to low temperature, so low, make the neutrons uh, uh, have a longer wavelengths. This is advantageous uh, in the uh, neutron guide system because uh, the uh, total reflection depends on the wavelengths. The longer the wavelengths is the uh, critical angle for the total reflection is larger. So the, if we are cooling the neutrons, then uh, you can, we can uh, have a much better uh, angular acceptance in the guide system. This is the layout of the reactor hole. So the reactor is here. Uh, this is the reactor core. You can see the cold source is here. Then we have three neutron guides, uh, which goes to the, the uh, guide hole. And then we also have uh, instruments around the reactor. And uh, <coughs> I want to go over them. There is no, no enough time to look all of them up. But basically, they are uh, good for uh, neutron scattering research. Uh, mainly, uh, uh, they are in here at the guide hole. And this one is a, a, a radiography tomography station at the reactor. We also have a time of flight facility, which is able to uh, uh, chop the neutron beam with a, uh, an, uh, three uh, chopper system and uh, uh, select uh, 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 and make a bunch of beam with uh, well-defined wavelengths, what they can use also for scattering. Then in the guide hall, we, al we also have scattering instruments, reflectometer, small angle neutron scattering, uh, triplex spectrometer, and uh, then we also have the PGNU system at the end of the first guide. And this is about 35 meters away from the reactor core. Now we go to the facility uh, in a closer look. This is a, a three-dimensional drawing of the current status of the experimental station. Uh, the, the neutrons are coming from this direction. Then we have the flight tube, and there are already two experimental stations. This is for, used for the PGA. Uh, the other one is used for the so-called PGAI. This is a atom gum activation imaging station. Uh, here we can do uh, the neutral radiography and tomography, including uh, 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 a, a capability to measure uh, elemental composition inside the material. So not bulk, but uh, a special place. I, I will uh, show you some examples at the end of the talk. Here you can see how we usually place uh, uh, prompt gamma samples. This is a powder sample wrapped in, in a, a fat foil. This is a fluorated uh, ethiopropylene foil bag, which uh, uh, just uh, keeps together the, the powder. Then it also uh, relatively transparent for the neutrons. It doesn't produce a lot of analytical signals, so we are not interfere with the composition uh, with the gamma rays coming from the real sample. So you put it into the target chamber. Then you can uh, put the whole system under vacuum, and you can uh, then uh, uh, switch on the neutron beam. 
uh, which, uh, uh, in fact, in the experimental station, we use two neutron beams, uh, the so-called upper beam and lower beam. This is uh, uh, made by uh, diaphragma, and they are separated uh, from each other about six centimeters. So the upper beam uh, goes to the PGA station, and lower beam goes to the other station, and they can be operated at the same time independently from each other. You can switch it on, switch it off when you want. Uh, this, uh, then uh, another important parameter is the, the spectral distribution of the beam. So the cold neutrons has also, uh, uh, you would expect a Maxwell distribution of the beam uh, energy profile. And the way you can uh, measure it is, is at the time of flight technique. Here you can see that uh, the neutron chopper, uh, which is uh, just a, uh, a blade, and uh, uh, the other side of the blade is covered by a highly absorbent material. I think in this case we used a, a, a lithium polymer. And then uh, we made a very narrow slit between the uh, absorption, uh, you can see here. Then you can also make a very small hole from the beam with a lithium-contained polymer. So then uh, the beam diameter was on the order of uh, two millimeter. Then if you put together the system, then uh, you can chop the beam. And then you can also place uh, uh, a position sensitive uh, detector, uh, which is here. This is a helium three field positive, uh, position sensitive uh, uh, wire cell uh, produced uh, by this company. And uh, it is filled up with three bar of, uh, of uh, helium-3 plus uh, CF4, two bar. Then, uh, then uh, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, sp spatial resolution of, the, uh, of this system is in the order of uh, one millimeter. Um, but the, as you can see, the sensitive area is uh, 18 centimeter by 18 centimeter, so it can you can read out about a thousand channel horizontally and uh, and vertically. Then you can also measure the time when the neutrons arrived. Now, how we measure the uh, the uh, neutron uh, energy distribution? This is the the so-called uh, in the pinhole geometry. So there is a uh, you have the guide in which the neutrons are uh, bouncing around, and then uh, arrive to the end of the guide, then we use the uh, collimator slits and, and a pinhole here. Then, uh, then again collimated, then uh, they arrive to the screen. So everything will be upside down, left and right will be turned around, and things like that, but uh, still we can understand uh, this figure. So this shows... Uh, uh, the, sp the spatial and energy distribution of the beam. Uh, if uh, the, this uh, whole collimator was uh, uh, put to the right in the beam view, so beam is coming from behind me, then we put the, uh, from the middle of the guide, we put the beam hole to the right five millimeters. Then this looks like this. Then if it is in the middle of the beam, then it looks like that. And if you go to the left, then it looks differently. So this is a, a rather inhomogeneous uh, beam from this point of view. Uh, this uh, uh, other figure shows uh, uh, the composition of the beam, uh, spatial composition. This, uh, this is a horizontal, vertical direction. And uh, in this uh, wavelength range, from zero to one angstrom, uh, one to two angstrom, two to three, three to four, and as you can see, it is uh, higher the wavelengths, then you have the larger beam. But this is no wonder, because then the guide is more efficient for the higher wavelengths. So you get more and more beam as you go to the higher wavelengths region. So this is the end of the movie. And we can see here a four-dimensional figure. 
of the beam. So two, then, uh, two axes, the X and Y, uh, which is running here and there. And the Z, Z is the time, the f uh, time of flight time uh, relative to the uh, trigger signal of the chopper. And X and Y is the distribution, uh, spatial distribution, which observed uh, by the, by the uh, multi-wire chamber. And you can see here uh, three different uh, count range. So if you uh, only look for the, uh, the maximum count rates, then this looks like this. And uh, this is a nice system. I don't know whether you know this Livermore system, uh, Visit. Then you can turn around this. I, I am not prepared for a demonstration of that. But this is very nice. Then you can cut. Actually, you can cut at any direction, and uh, you can uh, go into the the this uh, 3D body, basically. Uh, what is this 3D body? The, the intensity of neutrons at different uh, places, uh, and in two dimension and in time. So this is a rather complicated body. Okay, now uh, this is f the, if you use all of the counts. Then uh, you see that this is bigger than, and this is uh, 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 from zero to 300 counts. Now, if you make projections, what we just practiced at, uh, for in the case of uh, uh, cross-section data, then you can uh, also project it uh, to the time channel. So then simply adding up all of the uh, uh, signals in the X and Y direction. And uh, then uh, I show this uh, left, right, and middle uh, placement of the pinhole. And as you can see, the, the spectrum, spectral composition of the beam did not change very much. So we can see that horizontally, at least the energy distribution of the beam is uh, quite similar to each other. We just have a, a spatial uh, differences in the beam. Then, then you can also see, sorry, you can also see a, a figure of uh, all of the data or the middle data basically in, in the energy dimension. And uh, why does it look so ugly? It should, we should, we would, uh, we would expect uh, a Maxwell distribution. Well, the Maxwell, Maxwell distribution would look like, uh, in this case, like uh, like uh, this. Okay, but we have some more instruments in the beam, and uh, they are scattering out neutrons. So then uh, you can see the breakages. So they are using scatterers, which has breakages. So then we actually observe something like this instead of having the whole beam. So this was taken away by those guys. And then uh, if you have many people around, then you cannot do anything with that. We need to live with this truncated spectral distribution of neutrons. Now, the, there's uh, another important thing in uh, determining the composition is the detector efficiency. You can see here uh, detector efficiency, a very uh, high precision measurement uh, for our detector system. Uh, what you see here, that uh, this is an uh, absolute efficiency. So then the highest uh, efficiency we have that system is uh, 10 to minus 3, a little bit more than 10 to minus 3. Then it is falling uh, as the energy, the gamma ray energy is increasing rapidly. And at the end of, t at, at about 10 MeV, we have um, uh, two orders of magnitude less efficiency for the high energy gamma rays. And uh, up here, you can see that the deviation uh, from the curve uh, of the measure point. And as you can see, this is a, uh, shows rather uh, nice uh, small deviation. 
Uh, this is the way how we, you can calculate the efficiency from the measured quantities. The R here is the, the uh, rate of uh, a gamma peak. So the area would be R times uh, the measurement time. This is just the speed how the peak is coming. And then you have to divide with the activity of the source. So we used radioactive sources. So the activity is here. Then you also need the transition probability uh, for one decay, which is P gamma. Then if you make this uh, ratio, then you can get the efficiency. And um, you can get more information from here. Then how the curve is uh, actually uh, done. So you can get information there. <clears throat> then uh, the system is ideally uh, linear in energy, but it is not always. And uh, in the case of on PGA, this is an important uh, factor that uh, the system is not completely linear. And this is just a, a so-called nonlinearity curve. The definition is here. So what you see on this uh, uh, axis, the y-axis, is uh, measurements, many, many uh, gamma peaks, a position were measured uh, of uh, radioactive sources and some uh, uh, prompt gamma sources. And then uh, they actually measured uh, uh, from the actually fitted uh, peak position in channel number. Uh, we subtracted the, this quantity, which is a, a transformation of the literature energy to channel number. Okay, then uh, the difference ca can be then figured out, and then it looks like that. So then uh, it means that uh, 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 in our case, uh, one channel is about one keV. So then uh, since uh, you can see that from this point to here, uh, we have about two or three channel difference, then it means that we can be off uh, one, two, three channels if we do not apply this uh, correction from the uh, the ideal uh, energy. Then you can also get more information from here. Now the salary. So how can we get to the uh, the uh, composition? So this is uh, in fact that how you would calculate uh, a peak area, which is measured by the the system. This is the the probability of the gamma ray. Uh, uh, if you capture one neutron, then we have the detector efficiency, which can depend on the, the uh, is, which is depending on n and the, the, uh, the place where the gamma is coming from. Then the number of nuclei, if you have a, an inhomogeneous target, then it also depends on the place. Then uh, the correction factors for the absorption of neutrons and photons also has a special uh, in, uh, Dependence, then we have to uh, integrate over the cross section and the flux. Now, if we make all of these a simplification, so what was just a, a fast summary. So we have one over V nuclei. The sample is homogeneous. Then this means that it doesn't depend on R, the spa space. Then uh, we do not have any tra uh, absorptions. Then the flux doesn't change in the sample, and the flux doesn't change in, uh, in time. Then uh, for reactors, this is always the case. Then you can simplify the whole equation and obtain this. Otherwise, you need to make Monte Carlo calculation on the whole process. And for ideal sample, which is described here, what is that? Then you can use this very simple formulation. And uh, in here, the, you can see that uh, phi th, this is the so-called thermal equivalent flux, which gives uh, the same rate as uh, our neutron beam gives as gold. So this is just a relative number. Now, this is uh, how we make uh, the internal standardization of an experiment. Uh, if you have two of these uh, peak areas in the spectrum, you have a comparator in the spectrum. 
So if you want to make, uh, for example, cross-section ex experiment, then you have to use a comparator together with the which well-known uh, comparator together with the the unknown, basically unknown uh, cross-section material. Then, then you can simply divide the two equations, the two areas, peak areas. And then the nice thing is that uh, that uh, the flux goes away for ideal samples. Then if everything is well mixed, then uh, uh, you end up only with these quantities. So the rest of it is gone from the sample. Then if you rearrange this, then uh, you can determine the concentration. If you rearrange it another way, uh, uh, express the cross-section, then you need to know, of course, then the number of atoms in the sample, then you can determine the cross-section. You can also determine, for example, uh, the the efficiency from this, if you know all the other things. Okay, so this is uh, the uh, the theory is very simple. If everything is ideal, now uh, some problem which is not so well known for the efficiency. Uh, uh, do we have the efficiency ratio appears here in the equation? And uh, we use the same efficiency. This is uh, we measured it, and uh, this is the same. Now this uh, then this means that it has correlation. Then this is just uh, the formula which determines the uh, the uh, uncertainty of this division. Then you can write it in this way. And we have here uh, since we fit our data with a polynomial, then we we have here a matrix which is uh, multiplied with uh, uh, some vectors which contains the, the power of, uh, of uh, the polynomial. In this case, uh, uh, this would be the logarithm of, uh, of energy, and uh, V is the, the uh, normal matrix uh, which is used in the, the uh, chi-square fit. Now, the interesting thing here is that uh, there is a subtraction here. So this term is uh, uh, can uh, lower the the uncertainty. Here I, I draw this ratio, uh, fixing uh, the the energy two uh, the energy two in this formula, which is in the denominator to 500, and also did the calculation with the, uh, neglecting this term. This is the red curve, and you can see that uh, around this fixed position, the, uh, basically, the uncertainty goes to zero. But that's what we expect. So if you have something uh, with the same energy, then, then there shouldn't be any difference in the efficiency. So then uh, the uncertainty, which is coming from the efficiency, is zero. And this is just another example. If I fix E2 to 2 MeV, or uh, sorry, uh, 5 MeV, then you can see that it is a much bigger change here. So the, uh, uh, if you choose it uh, uh, right, then uh, you can, uh, if, you in the, if you use here not the absolute value of the energy, but the relative, uh, not energy, but efficiency, but the relative efficiency, then you can have much more precision. On, the, on, the, on this part, you can see the uncertainty in percentage. And this is, of course, the efficiency curve in both cases. And you can see that there is a huge difference in the uncorrelated and the correlated quantities. Now, this is the way how we can then uh, finally determine a cross-section. So this is just a rearrangement of the equation you have already seen. And there are uh, several ways you can determine cross-section uh, uh, from our measurements. Uh, this equation here is uh, a decay, decay, using decay gamma rays. Then here you need to know the usually this uh, p gamma, which can be a problem. Then you can uh, calculate the, all of the primary intensities. Here the problem is that we don't know that uh, all of the primary uh, gamma rays. Then you can also sum up all of the gamma rays which goes to the ground state. Uh, with the, uh, using this formula, then uh, get the total cross-section. 
the problem here that uh, this is uh, also lacking all of the gamma rays which goes to the ground state. However, uh, uh, for this, this is a more, more complicated method than, uh, than it uses the level scheme, basically. So you, if you have a good level scheme, then you can use this. But this one, which is equivalent, the one which, which is the so-called energy proportional <coughs> detector, what uh, was explained yesterday by Carlo. This is, uh, here is the energy proportionality. This is, uh, uh, some other people call it uh, inverse Q value. That's me. But uh, basically, this, there used to be a, a Q value test in which uh, you could determine how well your uh, uh, decay scheme uh, was performing in the capture process. But here, uh, you can also use this if you take the inverse and to calculate the total cross-section. This is nothing else than the energy-weighted uh, uh, gamma production cross-sections uh, and sum up for all of the gamma. So this is simple. So you fit all of the peaks in your spectrum, then you can calculate this. Then you get a cross-section. Of course, uh, it's not, not always. If you have a, a complicated nuclei, then you have a zillions of tra transitions. Right? This, is, this has to be more tricky. So then, uh, uh, then in this case, one need to so-called unfold the gamma ray spectra and to find all of the uh, full energy peaks without the Compton background or the uh, uh, con background continuum. Then you can apply this formula and calculate the cross-section. Uh, there are problems with one non one over V nucleide. Then uh, this is just a, uh, a figure of a ratio here. So we have the real cross-section of X. X is uh, one of these nuclei. Then divided by the one over V uh, formula. And that's what you can see here uh, the, as uh, figures. Then except this one, which is argon, uh, all, all of the others uh, looks like almost straight line, or at least uh, uh, fitable with a second order polynomial. So then uh, you need to modify the calculation. Then the calculation, what was shown before, uh, won't be so simple. You have to put here the non one over v uh, uh, cross section, and you see that uh, we have uh, not such a nice uh, spectral distribution of the neutrons. Then you need to calculate the integral. Integral. Okay. Then uh, if we express this f, what I've just shown before, then you can uh, you can replace the cross section with the f and take out the one over v part. Then you can calculate this y. And then, for example, in the case of cadmium-113, uh, you can fit this for this. Uh, cadmium-113 is this one. You can fit it with a second-order uh, polynomial with this one. Then if you plug it into the, uh, this uh, integral, then you can perform numeric integration with our spectrum. And then it comes out that this is a, a, a 0.87 as high as if it would be a 1 over v function. So this is actually smaller. Then, then you can uh, proceed as before. The library, just uh, very fast. So there used to be uh, two libraries, and one of the the most uh, famous is the Lone Library, which, which was a compilation of uh, MIT measured data, reactor data. However, it had a lot of uh, uncertainties. So in summary, then, we decided that we have to, uh, people tried to use this, and, uh, and at that time, uh, that was in the 90s, uh, uh, people uh, always measured their own values, and uh, then there were no no, an integrated library. But uh, most of them realize that the loan table is not sufficient for uh, analysis. 
Then we decided to remeasure uh, basically the whole uh, periodic table at our instrument, and we did it. And uh, uh, with the uh, thermal beam and the uh, gui always guided beam, then uh, you know, the first time we didn't have a cold beam, just a guided beam. Then uh, we uh, call it thermal guided beam. That, but anyway, then we measured all of the elements and we compared them to so-called primary standards, which is hydrogen, nitrogen, carbon, and some secondary standards, which is chlorine and uh, and uh, uh, sulfur, uh, which were, uh, of course, measured uh, to a primary stand, uh, a standard. Then we tried to use uh, 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 compounds uh, in which one of these elements uh, were present, and uh, the, we used the comparison equation to determine uh, the partial gamma ray cross-section, which is uh, basically in the formula. So the partial gamma ray, yeah, here, this is the, the partial gamma ray cross-section. This is a, you have that for every peak in the spectrum. Okay. So this was done. Then uh, the analysis was done uh, with this code. You will uh, see a demonstration uh, in the afternoon. How does it work? And uh, this code was uh, basically written uh, by this uh, person who is deceased in the meanwhile. And, but we worked uh, really quite a lot on this code. Then uh, we made it, uh, uh, then uh, we were in collaboration with Rick Firestone from Lawrence Berkeley lab Laboratory. He, he did the comparison of our data with the uh, evaluated uh, nuclear structure data library, which was presented yesterday, then uh, identified uh, uh, the isotopes uh, uh, to the peak, which were measured. And uh, uh, the, we ended up uh, with a library of 32,000 uh, gamma ray data uh, for which we measured uh, gamma ray energy, the, this uh, partial gamma ray cross-section, and uh, other features. Uh, we also measured that for decaying gamma rays, which were also in the spectrum. Uh, the whole thing was summarized in this book. If you can't get this book and still you are interested in that, then... Uh, yeah, yeah, just this is uh, how uh, the data is presented in the book. So then you have a spectrum, then, uh, then uh, it was analyzed, then gives uh, many information about the experiment. Then we also have table, uh, tables in the book for all of the elements, and it gives the uh, first 100 peaks. Oops. Uh, which is uh, uh, most intense peaks in the in the spectrum. Then uh, we underlined, highlighted the ones we recommend for analysis. But there is also another uh, work uh, which summarized uh, basically a, a same data set. This was done uh, in this IAE uh, CRP. Uh, you can find that on the internet. Here is the reference. And we were also working a lot on the, the calibrations, uh, how to improve the uh, efficiency calibration. So then there, there is also some work in this uh, uh, book of IEA on these isotopes. Then you can also find the references here. This is just a, a, a spectrum of one of the primary standards. Uh, this is one of the uh, prompt gamma, gamma uh, primary standard for us, uh, the nitrogen, uh, which we usually use uh, in, in urea. Um, we measure urea. If it is possible, we measure urea D, uh, the deuterated urea, so then the, the hydrogen line would not uh, rule the spectrum. Uh, this table summarizes the the sensitivity. So sensitivity gives you, uh, sensitivity is high if uh, the cross-section is high. If you go back to the formula, then you can understand uh, how. 
Uh, then uh, this, uh, you can see here the detection limits, which is uh, also uh, proportional to the uh, sense or corresponds to the sensitivity. And this color table shows you that uh, which is, uh, we are most sensitive for boron, cadmium, rare earth elements, then uh, sensitive for hydrogen, scandium, cobalt, etc. You can get around this. Uh, figure to understand with which are the uh, most uh, easy to observe elements. Now, how all of this is uh, validated? This is always a, a, a good question. Am I right, Damas? The validation is very important for IEA. Then the, all of this data can be validated uh, through uh, so-called so certified standards. Here you can see seven of them. I don't go into the details, I will show only one. Uh, one of the uh, standard is uh, shown here for the major element. And uh, you can see here this uh, the, the fit value is not one, it still has some uh, problem here and there, but uh, uh, this is very good. And uh, what you can see here, the certified uh, uh, weight percentage of the elements in the, the geological sample and the measured one with PGA and it ideally it's on a, is, is on a, a straight line, a 45 degree straight line. And you can see that indeed the measurements are, are very well around this. Then I will, on the next figure I will enlarge this part. So then you can see that it is still not so bad. There are many, many, many elements here, and there are some so for which we didn't have data, and uh, there were some for uh, the certified didn't have data. So then, uh, this is the life. So that's uh, basically what um, uh, I wanted to say, and I invite you to for the demonstration in the room next to us. So do you have any questions?